Welcome to the Antagma Premium Course on Volumes. So what exactly are volumes? Well, think about it this way. This Rubik's Cube consists of those tiny cubes, and we call those tiny individual cubes here voxels. You can think of them as kind of 3D pixels. What we will do here is, in the future, we're going to look at a slice of a volume. So just one layer of those cubes, just because they're easier to visualize. But keep in mind that actually a volume consists of many layers of those slices of cubes. Each individual cube can store a value. And usually this is either a number, be it a float number or an integer number, or it's a vector. So a combination of two, three, or more numbers, usually specifying a velocity or a direction. And the way you can think about this data storage is the data of each voxel is stored at the voxel's center. So what actually happens if, for example, we want to read out and we call this sampling? What happens if we would like to sample data in the middle between those two voxels containing a five and a six? Well, Houdini makes it easy for us and interpolates between those numbers. Between five and six, there would be the 5.5. So if we'd sample exactly in between those two voxels, we would get a 5.5 in return. So this is the bare minimum that we need to know about volumes to get started. So in Houdini, let's look at some of the basic tools and workflows that exist for volumes. Let's drop down a Geosop, dive in there, delete the file node, drop down a volume. And what you'll see here is the outline, the wireframe of the volume. Let me disable the grid and you might see it better. This is the size of our volume. And there are two types of volumes in Houdini, BDBs and standard Houdini volumes. And in the first part, we're only dealing with standard volumes. So what the volume sub allows me to do is specify certain things. On the one hand, it allows me to specify the rank of the volume. That means which type of data a volume stores. And a scalar is just a single number per voxel. Then there is the vector, which allows me to store a three-dimensional vector, which is used for velocity, for example, or for pointing in a certain direction. And finally, we can also store a matrix. Then I can specify the name my volume should have. Usually it's called density, but you can name it whatever you like. V for velocity or vel are common names as well, or really whatever you like, A, B, C, whatever. Let's set this to be a scalar vector so it stores just a number. And in this node, I can specify the dimensions of my volume. That is the size, the center of it, and if it has a taper or if it's two dimensional. After that, we can specify the individual voxel size. That means we can specify how big those individual cubes in the volumes are. And I can specify this by either telling Houdini to divide the longest axis of the volume by 10. So each voxel here would be a 10th of the length of the edges. Or I can do it by specifying the sampling along an individual axis. I can also specify non-square voxels. So voxels that are not cubic, but a bit stretched in one direction. Or what I'd like to do best is by size. So I can enter a voxel size directly. And let's scale this down a bit, say to 0.05. What I have now is an empty volume. So when I middle mouse over my node here, I can see that I created a volume called density and it's 20 by 20 by 20 voxels in size. That makes it 8,000 voxels. We pretty much see nothing. That is because those voxels are empty at the moment. They each store a zero. So there's nothing for Houdini to display. If we want to give those voxels an initial value, we can do this up here and just dial up this initial value. And we see we get this foggy kind of cube thing going here. And that is because Houdini automatically tries to visualize a standard volume as a fog or as a cloudy type of volume. And what Houdini assumes is that in here we specified the density of fog. So as we are dialing the individual voxels density up, my fog also gets denser. So let's dial that back to say zero and attach a volume bob. And volume bobs, exactly like point bobs or primitive bobs, allow you to manipulate individual elements of our volume. That is, in our case, individual voxels. So let's wire this up, highlight the volume bob, and dive in there. Within the volume bob, we have those two standard subs. One is the global input. So we get globally bound variables in here, like the current voxels position, because what we are doing in the volume bob is we iterate over individual voxels. That is, we run over each individual voxels and in here, here, you specify what happens to an individual voxel. So P is the position of the current voxel that we're working on. Density is its density. IX, IY, and IZ are the indices of our current voxel. So that means they count from voxel 000, 000 all up to voxel, in our case, 19, 19, 19. That is because each side of our volume currently has a length of 20 voxels. So we start at zero and go to voxel 19, that makes 20 voxels, and that in each direction yields those indices. 
the res x res y and res z store the volumes resolution that is the overall amount of voxels they have along the x y and z axis the center will return the volume center the orange output will return the bottom left corner of the volume that is its origin the size which is a vector will return the size of our volume in x y and z and then there are these three dpdx dpdy and dpdz and they are steps that you have to take to get to the next voxel in x, y, and z direction. And they are stored as a vector, so you can handily add or subtract them to the current position or from the current position and get the position of the adjacent voxel in x, y, and z or multiply them and get another voxel's position. Also, there is the bb value, which will return the current voxel position in regard to the bounding box. What that means is this. Consider each of our voxels axes ranging from 0 from the origin to 1 here or 1 there, 1 there. And what bb will return is a vector just like the p, our current position, but in regard to where in the voxel it is. So it will range from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1 here. And in the center, this value will be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Also, we have the usual suspects like time, time increment, frame, etc. So what I'd like to do in the volume bob now is create a noise. And I'm going to use the unified noise for that. It's a bit slower than, for example, the anti-alias noise, but offers better parameters to tweak the appearance of the noise. What I need to do in order to be able to use this is wire in the position for current voxel in here in the noise. Make sure it is set to 3D input because we're piping in a vector, a three-dimensional one, and we expect a 1D noise output for our density. So let's wire up the density up here into the volume bot output. Now, I would like to be able to tweak this noise one level up in my geo context. So I'm going to promote some parameters, for example, the standard parameters like the base noise type, the frequency, the offset, and the period of the fractal noise, as well as the fractal type, its octaves, lacunarity, and roughness. So by middle mouse clicking on those ports here and selecting pro promote parameter, what I've actually done is when I dive up one level, highlight this SOP, I created an interface here where I can drive my noise. Another thing that I'd like to do is, diving into the VOP again, after the noise, I'd like to attach a ramp parameter stop, which I'm gonna set up to be a spline ramp. So I have this kind of interface here and just drop it down in between the noise output and my density output here. Okay, what that allows me to do is, like a Photoshop curve, tweak the noise and its contrast, etc. Okay, so we see there is something happening here, but we don't see much. And to visualize what's actually going on in our volume, we have several tools in Houdini. The most basic is the volume slice, which just gives you a sliced plane through a volume with a color-coded representation of what values are in the volume now. So again, go up here and play with the ramp parameter a bit. I can see there's something happening here. And the volume slice node is quick for visualization. For example, if you have huge volumes, this is the quickest way to visualize what's actually happening. However, it's a bit clumsy because it will only give you one slice through volume. So if you want to see the whole volume, let's put that aside and drop down a volume visualization here wire this up and highlight it. And what I can do now here is, for example, if I would like to see a more dense fog in here, I can just go up here and crank up the density scale. And what that will do is it will just multiply my density values by this factor here and make it look more dense. So let's go in here, and dial back our values. So I can see now I can dial in a bit more of a contrasty noise that yields me those shapes here. Let's go up to the volume and increase the number of voxels by decreasing the individual voxel size like so. Middle mouse click on the volume to see we have now a volume that is 100 by 100 by 100 voxels in size. And by going onto our volume bob and changing the noise type, for example, to something like, uh, let's dial back this remap of the density values here. So if you change the noise to something like Worley, for example, and increase the frequency, like so, or maybe the Worley cellular type, and invert the response from the noise, like this, what we are creating here is kind of a Voronoi cell pattern. And it's super quick because it's just calculated from a Worley noise, which is really quick to compute. And its output is um, directly written into the volume. So let's increase the density scale a bit and maybe add some lights to this in order to be actually able to see something. So let's drop down a spotlight like this. Give it a bit of a bluish tint. And also in our material palette, let's select a basic smoke drag that over to materials and in the OBJ level assign that to our smoke geometry. The render tab under materials 
let's go to the materials and select the basic smoke. And what happens sometimes with the volume display in Houdini is that it doesn't update properly. What I just did is went back into the geo and into the volume visualization, just modified the density slider by a bit and boom, we have our volume there rendered with shading actually. So let's go back into the spotlight, dial down its intensity a bit, say 10, whoops, and add another spotlight by control clicking on the spotlight button. Have this here and maybe set its color to be a bit more orange like this. And again, I can see very little here. So let's go back into our geo and change the density slider. And we can see we are now getting that light from the second spotlight as well. So these are the basic techniques in Houdini of how to visualize scalar volumes. That is volumes that only store one value. Not only does the volume vis node allow us to dial in the density in which the volume is displayed, it also comes with lots of handy presets on how to map the density. For example, we have the increasing preset, which is the standard preset. We can also set it to be a decreasing preset, which will basically invert the display of the volume, which in our case will yield those cells instead of those dividing walls. We can choose a hill preset, which will only highlight values in between. This will give those double walled appearance in our case. We can have the values which is basically the inverse of the hill. So we'll get double walled cells in here, which are filled. We can have a very steep curve. So had I not dialed this in um, previously in the volume bob, it would give me those really stark contrasty edges now. And I can set the preset to be squared. So extreme values like zero or one do not get displayed. Also what this node allows us to do is go into the emissions tab and dial up the volume emission here. And we will get this kind of glow from our volume. Now this glow is kind of uniform, only broken up by our visualized density here. That is because we haven't specified an emissive field here. So Houdini assumes that the whole volume should glow. Let's just type in the density as an emission field in here. And we can see right now the glow only originates from the areas that have a density value greater than zero. So we now have a glowy and a foggy volume combined. Let's dial that back. And let me show you another technique for visualizing volumes that I just recently discovered. And that is by the primitive node. I just pipe in the volume here, highlight the primitive node and go to volumes. If we check adjust visualization, we can on the one hand, same as in our volume visualization node, dial up the density into something like 50. So it's not so stark. And we can change the display mode to something like rainbow. So in this case, the uh, rainbowy color is mapped to the voxels position within the volume. Also, we can display the the volume as an ISO surface. For that, I need to adjust the ISO contour value. And what that does is it tells Houdini to look for areas in our volume where this value is reached and then define this as a solid surface. So this is pretty similar to what actually happens when we try and mesh a volume or convert a volume to an SDF. So those are the basic ways of visualizing a scalar volume in Houdini. Let's move on to the vector volumes.